Hello and welcome to OT Over Easy. My name is Becca and today we are continuing our series on wheelchairs and specifically this video I'm going to be talking about different wheelchair features and when you might want to consider using them. As with all of my content, this is not a comprehensive list by any means of all possible wheelchair features out there. It is just intended as a study tool to help you focus on what is most important for you to know for a generalist OT exam. Unfortunately, I don't have these things in my house to show you as I talk about them. So if you are a visual learner, I highly recommend opening up an image search engine and typing them in as we go so you can see what they look like. Without further ado, let's crack on. First, let's talk about different armrests. A couple different kinds of armrests you can find are removable armrests, height adjustable armrests, or wraparound armrests. Now, the first two it kind of says in their name what they are, and I'm sure you can think about how that might be useful to have those features. A removable armrest you can take on and off, which could be helpful for transfers, for example. Height adjustable means you can adjust the height, which may not be so important in just a transfer chair. If you're in a hospital, maybe just you're getting someone from one room to another while they're there for their one day stay. But for a longer term patient, if whatever height the armrests come at is not a good height for them, it's helpful to have adjustable armrests. Wraparound armrests is a style of armrest that is best for space savers because it actually reduces the width of a wheelchair by an inch. So if you have an exam question that's talking about needing a wheelchair to fit through like a narrow space and it's asking about adjusting the wheelchair rather than the space, a wraparound armrest is a great way to give yourself an extra inch. With regards to armrests, you also want to think about different armrest attachments, such as an arm trough, a lap board, or mobile arm supports. So arm troughs are like little, little cushion cups um, that sit on top of an armrest for an arm to rest in, and that can be helpful for individuals perhaps who have had a stroke or unilateral neglect um, and don't have trouble keeping control and or track of their arm just to prevent it from sliding off and maybe getting caught in a wheel or something like that. It just helps keep it in. A lap board can also be used for a little bit of arm support and to help someone uh, keep it in a place where they know where it is. Um, lap boards also can be used for activities. So if you have someone that um, would benefit from having like a little table, like a little lap tray, that can be helpful. You want to consider your armrests if you're going to have a lap tray though, because the lap tray usually is going to go across the armrests. So if you have removable armrests and they're not going to have armrests on at any point, they can't use a lap board very easily if they don't have the armrests on. So that's something something to think about. And then mobile arm supports are helpful, particularly for individuals with spinal cord injuries, high level spinal cord injuries, um, and they don't have great control over their upper extremities. Um, it can be helpful to have something that can move and help them move their arms. So maybe they have a universal cuff in their hand with, let's say they're trying to eat, they've got a fork in their universal cuff. So they've got their utensil in their hand and then the mobile arm support can help support the arm um, so that they can get that fork with the universal cuff to their mouth. Now let's talk about leg rests. The main ones that you're going to want to be aware of for the generalist exam are going to be removable leg rests, swing away leg rests, and elevating leg rests. As the name suggests, removable leg rests can be removed. So you can completely detach them from the wheelchair and then put them back on again. Whereas swing away, they, instead of taking them all the way off, you can just sort of pivot them out to the side so that they are not as in the way. Obviously, if you take them all the way off, they're even less in the way. But depending on how that patient 
transfers, sometimes a swing away is enough, sometimes it's not, and you want to have the full removable. Elevating leg rests are going to be able to move up and down, and that's something that you may want to consider, especially for a patient that has a lot of lower extremity swelling, because elevation can help with that. So if you have someone with lymphedema or maybe acute swelling, elevating leg rests may be an important consideration for them. As far as foot plates go, some are completely static and you can't change them at all, and then some are swing away. So not to be confused with swing away leg rests, where the whole leg rest moves. Swing away foot plates is usually just the foot plate itself folds up or down. And a wheelchair may have both, it may only have one or the other. So again, when thinking about your client, you wanna think about what they need for transfers. For some people, it's not gonna be an issue if they have the mobility to just step over a foot plate and get up safely. Sometimes they need that swing away feature. And then foot plates can also come equipped with heel loops, which are loops that are on the back of the foot plate and they just help keep the patient's feet on the foot plate if they have a tendency for the feet to drift or slide backwards off of the foot plate. So it's not like an ankle strap, you're not tying the foot in, it's just a little bit of an extra um, support or barrier on the back of the plate to prevent that foot from slipping off the back. Speaking of slipping backwards, another feature that can be helpful for preventing chairs from falling backwards backwards are anti-tippers, which are small little extra wheels that go in the back of a wheelchair to prevent against the chair going backwards. A reason you may need that is for individuals who have had lower extremity amputations. And that's because if you think about the way weight is distributed in your body, legs are really, really heavy. And when you're sitting in a chair, they are towards the front of a chair. So if you have an individual who has lost one or both of their lower extremities, that is significantly going to shift their center of mass backwards because they're losing all that extra weight in the front of the chair. Because their, their center of gravity is moved backwards, they are at an increased risk of going over backwards in their chair. So for lower extremity amputees, an extra feature that you may want to consider for their wheelchair are anti-tippers. For an upper extremity amputee, something that you might want to consider would be a brake extender. So that's uh, an extra piece to increase the lever arm on a brake. So if, if they only have one arm, maybe they can reach the brake on this side just fine, but reaching over to this side, they can't quite reach it, so they may benefit from having an extra long lever for them to push. An extra long lever can also be helpful for anyone really who has any mobility concerns in terms of reaching down in order to manipulate their brakes. Could also just be someone who's maybe really short <laughs> and can't quite reach their brakes. So a couple different reasons you may want to have a brake extender. It also can reduce the amount of force needed to set the brakes on. If you think back to your physics classes you had to take in order to get into grad school, the longer the lever arm, the less force is required. So if they can't quite have the strength to get their short brakes on, if you add a brake extender, sometimes that will increase their independence in being able to lock and unlock their brakes on their own. For postural support, obviously to support the trunk, you can have seat belts and harnesses. I really wanna emphasize that those things should be used for postural support and not as restraints, okay? We are never trying to prevent a client from being able to get up and out of their chair. Gone are the days when it was okay for a healthcare provider to look at Grandma Sally Mae and be like, she keeps wandering off. We're just gonna tie her down so we don't lose track of her. Okay, harnesses and seat belts are okay for physical support, postural support, not okay for trying to secure a patient in the chair from getting up because of 
maybe cognitive deficits or maybe they just want to get up, they're, <laughs> they're driven to move, you need to find other strategies to try to keep them safe beyond tying them down. As well as having supports for the trunk and the torso, you can also have supports for the head that just look like a little headrest. And that can be really helpful, um, first of all, for feeding. You can imagine if you don't have head control and without any support, maybe you want your uh, natural postures to be like here. That is challenging to eat and sometimes not as safe as eating with the head in good alignment. It's also really important for communication, right? So if you, again, if your head is down here and someone is, you know, stood talking to me, it's very effortful to throw my gaze up to look them in the eye. So having head supports can be really important for social interactions, for eye contact and for communication. So that's a really important reason you may want to consider head support for someone who's not able to adequately control their head on their own. When thinking about the overall frame itself, the, the style of wheelchair, you can have a manual, manually propelled wheelchair, you can have an attendant propelled wheelchair, or an electronically propelled wheelchair. If it's a short-term use of the wheelchair, chances are you're just going to want to use an attendant propelled wheelchair because they're the cheapest and the easiest. You don't have to teach anyone how to, how to use it, um, you know, just for a short-term stint, maybe an acute injury, and you're only going to need it for a, a couple days. Otherwise, when determining if you want attendant propelled, manually propelled, or electronically propelled, you're going to want to consider the person's ability to propel themselves. Do they have the strength to use a manual wheelchair? Do they have the cognitive capacity to use either a manual or to learn how to drive an electronic wheelchair? Um, you want to think about the space that they have available in their home because electrical wheelchairs are really bulky. Can they even fit an electrical wheelchair in their home through the doorways and navigate their spaces? If they're gonna have an electrical wheelchair, they're also gonna need a specialist vehicle if they're gonna use a vehicle to get around. Whereas a manual wheelchair or an attendant propelled, you're gonna be able to potentially get that in the trunk of a car or the bed of a pickup truck. You've got more options with those than you do with an electric wheelchair. All of those things are going to factor in which kind you select. Power chairs are always going to be really, really big and bulky and heavy. And there's at the moment with current technology, there's not really any way to avoid that. With manual chairs, you have a little bit more flexibility with weights. So sometimes you can have a really lightweight wheelchair and that can be particularly helpful for someone who is going to be trying to lift that thing up to get it into the bed of a pickup truck. Sometimes you can have a collapsible frame and that can also be helpful again for transportation if you can minimize its footprint and slide it into the back seat of a car more easily for transport. Or you can have bigger, sturdier frames. In particular, you can get specialty bariatric chairs for people who live with significant obesity, where a standard wheelchair is not going to be able to cope with either their size and or their weight. And then finally, you have reclining and tilt in space features. So the difference between the two are reclining, if this is the seat and this is the back of the chair, in a reclining chair, the angle between the two changes. In a tilt in space, the angle stays the same and they move together as a unit. Both can be helpful for postural adjustments, particularly if you have an individual who is not able to do little manual adjustments themselves using their upper extremities or they're not able to get out of their chair. Um, having those tilt in space or recline features can be helpful for pressure relief. A reclining wheelchair can be really helpful if you have a patient who is prone to episodes of hypotension or autonomic dysreflexia and they need quick postural adjustments. It can be really helpful for that. However, you want to be careful if you have a patient with hip precautions um, that prevent them from assuming different positions. You also want to be careful if they have spasticity that can be affected by their position. 
sometimes increased hip extension can trigger an increase in spasticity. So you want to be watching out for that as well before recommending a reclining wheelchair. So that's it for this one. If you have any questions or ideas for content that you'd like to see me cover in future videos, just leave them in the comments down below and I'll see it. Otherwise, as always, I hope this video made learning this content just a little more easy, and I wish you the best of luck in studying. See you next time!